to the fact that uh, we have a camp meeting coming up, I'd like to help God to prepare our hearts for what could happen. I trust for you that this is more than just a meeting, that God will do something supernatural in your heart and my heart. Say, preacher, what kind of things could God do? You know, that's what we're going to look at this morning, Luke chapter number 9. Luke chapter 9, I'd like us to read together just three verses. We could read verse 28, 29, and 30. Again, if we could read together, reading out loud, Luke chapter 9, verse 28, 29, and 30. Let's begin there in verse 28. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for each one that's here. Lord, we trust that you will speak to our hearts. Help us to, as we are looking at a very familiar passage of the Bible, help us, Lord, to find something that would help us, especially as we are getting ready for this camp meeting. Lord, direct our thoughts, our words, fill me with your spirit. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Do you know, I think that uh, these three verses here in Luke 9 are familiar to many. It's, uh, we've referred to it as the Mount of Transfiguration. You say, well, preacher, what's happening here? Our Lord has just been busy sending out his 12 apostles. In fact, you're there in Luke chapter 9. Look, if you would, in verse number 1. Luke chapter number 9 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and so in the beginning of Luke chapter 9, Jesus has gathered his 12, sent them out to preach two by two in the communities that they went to. And we know that shortly after that, they returned. Look there in Luke 9 and verse 10. And the apostles, when they were returned, told them all that they had done, and so they gave a report. We might call that a missionary furlough. But they gave a report to the Lord of all the things that had happened and you know, as Jesus was taking a time for some rest and relaxation with those apostles, the Bible tells us that our Lord took three of those apostles up on top of a mountain. Again, look there in Luke chapter number 9, verse 28. And it came to pass about an eight days after these things, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. So they'd just been away in ministry. They came back and gave a report. And Jesus handpicked three of those 12 apostles, Peter, James, and John. And he took them up onto a mountain. They had a little bit of a prayer meeting up there. And then look there in verse 29. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering, and you know, they saw Jesus as they'd never seen him before. And if that wasn't enough, we read of something else that happened, verse 30. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias. And I know that those are Old Testament characters, but you'd have to agree, they'd just been out preaching. I'm sure some places the preaching went well. Other places, maybe not quite as well. That's just the reality of ministry. When they came back to report to the Lord of all that had happened, our Lord took three of them up into a mountain, and they saw some things that they'd never seen before. And they heard of some things that they'd never heard before. And I think that God lifted those three men to, if we could say, to a, a spiritually higher ground... They didn't know what would happen, but I think that after it happened, they were never the same. You know, if you've been around church and Christianity for any period of time, we call that a mountaintop experience. And I'd like to preach this morning on the benefits of a mountaintop experience. You say, well, preacher, they didn't stay on that mountain. They had to go back down. Why would God even do this for them if they weren't going to stay up there? And the answer to that is the same reason God sometimes gives you and I mountaintop experiences. There are some things that happen 
in those unusual times that don't happen at other times. And I think it would be fair and, and good for each one of us to pray, Lord, it's just 10 days away and, and, and we're making all the plans and all the preparations to be ready for this. But God, we're asking you to do something in our lives that we can't do. And even if you would pray, Lord, would you please give us a mountaintop experience? It's true in the history of this church that God has chosen to do that a number of times. You can't orchestrate it. You can't make it happen. No more than these three disciples could make it happen. It had to be part of God's plan for their lives. And you know, with these days ahead, we, we're trusting that God will charge us up and, and encourage us. But you say, preacher, is it just a hype? Is it just, no, there's something far more that can be accomplished in that. You know it's true that our Lord took uh, Noah. And our Lord set Noah in that ark on a mountaintop. It's called Mount Ararat. And they saw some things that they'd never seen before. We know it's true that uh, God took Abraham up on top of a mountain. And God did some things for Abraham that God had never done for him before. We also know that God took Moses up on a mountain, and that's where he was commissioned. That's where he was called. We know that's where he was equipped to do what otherwise he couldn't have done. When Moses was up on that mountain, God gave him the Ten Commandments, and God gave him the blueprints for tabernacle. Moses had no intentions of those things before he went up. God did something supernatural in his life when he was there, and I'm saying that it would be good if we pray, God, would you do something supernatural? Would you do something that cannot be fabricated by men in our hearts in these days that are ahead? You know, just as much as Abraham and Noah and Moses needed that, I think we need it. I've had a number of you that say, Preacher, we need this camp meeting. It's been two years where we've missed it, and we need it. Now, unless you are a super Christian, and there probably aren't too many of those this morning, you need it too. They say, preacher, what could happen at a mountaintop experience? Let's have a look at that again. I'm preaching on the benefits of a mountaintop experience. Look there again at Luke chapter 9 and verse 28. The Bible says, and it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings. He, Jesus, took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his, Jesus' countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. Now we know that our Lord took some of those twelve apostles, and their names are given there, Peter, James, and John. We know that those men were already part of the inner circle. It seems that whenever a task was to be done, those were the first three men to be called to do it. We might say that they were on the front lines of the ministry. Maybe they were a little more committed than the other nine of those apostles. Do you know those three were always busy for the Lord? Those three were always committed for the Lord. Those three were always engaged in the service of the Lord. And you know one drawback of being always busy for the Lord? and always faithful, and always serving, is you can become always tired. Do you know you can get tired in the ministry? I'm not saying being tired of the ministry. We don't want to get there. But you can get tired in the ministry. It can become mechanical. It can come to the place where as a preacher, it's just an outline that's alliterated. It can come to the place where you're an usher that's just trying to get people seated quickly and, and you lose the fact that these are people that they've come and they need something. You can be teaching a Sunday school class and all it is is a story and, and, a, and a coloring craft and let's quickly get... I'm saying that you can be in the ministry and tired in the ministry. Could I suggest to you that Peter, James, and John, though they very much were in the ministry. Maybe things had become repetitious to them. 
We've all heard the statement, familiarity breeds contempt. And sometimes the more that you're around people, that exciting edge of those people kind of wears down. And I'm saying the very first reason that our Lord took them up on that mountain is our Lord wanted them to see more in Him than just ministry. If you're taking notes this morning, the first benefit of a mountaintop experience is for inspiration. That we might see our Lord better. Maybe you sing songs for the Lord, but it's just another song. Maybe you preach messages for the Lord, but it's just another message. Maybe you uh, teach class, but it's just another class. Maybe you usher, but it's just ushering. And it's, maybe you work in the kitchen or the nursery. And I'm saying sometimes we can lose sight of the very one that we're serving. And I say to you that the very first reason that our Lord took them up there was for inspiration. Now, you'd have to admit, they had seen the Lord. By this time in Luke 9, they had been with the Lord at least a year and a half. A year and a half of their ministry had already passed. And I'm sure that the excitement of the first day they met the Lord, it wasn't the same. Yeah, that's the Lord. I'm sure there's Jesus. I'm supposed to meet him at 6. Better be there in time. I'm saying it was just routine. And I, we won't have a show of hands. We wouldn't do that. But I wonder if your Christianity has become routine. Sunday, better go to church. Wednesday, is time for Bible study. Morning, better get my Bible reading done. And I'm saying that sometimes we lose sight of the fact that if God doesn't open our eyes to the greatness of our Lord, it's just going to get old. And maybe, just maybe, that's why Christians in churches all across our country and churches all across the states and all around the world who've been going to those churches for years and years are without any explanation walking. You say, Pastor, have they lost their salvation? No, it's not possible to do that. But they've lost that sight of what the precious Lord Jesus Christ is all about. And I'm saying to you, maybe, just maybe what we need the most, maybe what you need the most, Though you're very busy doing things for the Lord is this thing we call inspiration. It's God breathing a life into something that doesn't have life. Maybe we could say that Peter, James, and John, though they had known the Lord over a year and a half by this time, I think it'd be fair to say they'd never seen the Lord like this. They'd never seen the Lord as it says there in the end of verse 29, in raiment that was white and glistering. <laughs> Never seen that before. But the Lord knew they needed to see that. And could I suggest that you make that one of your prayers? But you know, for a rare time in their lives, just maybe it was something more than just doctrinal lessons. It was God. Maybe now for a short time in their life. It was more than just ministering to others. It was seeing Jesus again very first reason that we see the benefit of a mountaintop experience is for inspiration. Again, that we might see the Lord better. You know, we read of Isaiah, and why don't you keep your hand there in Luke 9 and turn to Isaiah chapter number 6. If you have the middle of your Bible, would be Psalms and then Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah. So we're about four or five books after Psalms. Isaiah Chapter number 6, Isaiah chapter 6. Now, if you have dates in your Bible, then you would know that uh, by the time we get to Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah, whose ministry stretched possibly 80 years of his life, by this time, Isaiah chapter 6, he's already been in the ministry. But God did something to him in Isaiah chapter 6, that just kind of sped him on in this ministry. Look there in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. Isaiah says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. 
And it says in verse 3, And one cried, talking about the seraphim there in heaven, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. You'd have to agree that Isaiah is seeing something in verse 1, 2, 3, and 4 that he didn't see on a normal basis. Are you seeing the Lord as he's never seen the Lord before? Look at his reaction in verse 5. Then said I, Isaiah is speaking, woe is me. For I am undone because of a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Look there in verse number 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And, and I'm saying to you when Isaiah was reminded about the greatness of his God, and when he began to hear the call of God for someone to go, he said, Lord, I'll go. He's already been in the ministry for a while. But he needed to see the Lord as he'd never seen him before. Preacher, what are the benefits of a mountaintop experience? And the first one is for inspiration. That we might see the Lord as we've never seen him before. In the book in the Gospels, you can let go of Isaiah back to Luke again, but... In the Gospels, we won't turn to it, John chapter 12. Some Greeks came to one of the apostles, Philip, and said, we would see Jesus. Well, no doubt they'd already heard of him. No doubt they already knew the details of him. They just wanted to see the Lord. They didn't want to get close to him. We know that the religious leaders, we know that in John chapter 7, they sent some of their soldiers to go and arrest Christ. Okay, if that's the order, we'll do it. John 7, in verse number 43, 44, 45, they came back without Christ. Well, they were sent to arrest Christ. And those religious leaders, they said, where is he? You know what their answer was? They said, never man speak like this man. They just spent some time before they were going to arrest him to listen to him, not to listen to things about him, to listen to him. And they came back and they said, we never heard words like that. Preacher, what could be accomplished at the camp meeting? First of all, you could get a glimpse of the Lord like you've never got before. Or maybe it's been a long time. Could it be that you teach in a Sunday school or a master club? How easy it is for anyone to be in a prolonged ministry the reality of the Lord that you're serving kind of wanes. Maybe you preach behind a pulpit. And I appreciate every man here that preaches behind the pulpit. But if you do it time and time again, after a while it can just be an outline. Some of them good outlines, some of them not so good. Maybe you sing. Maybe you play an instrument. Maybe you can sing that particular song or play that particular song better than other songs, but is it just a song? Or is it a song done for him, to please him? Maybe you work in the nursery, maybe you work in the kitchen, maybe you're an usher, maybe you help maintain this property, and is it, is it just a task? I say to you that Moses, when he went up on the mountain, his fellowship with God was so sweet. The Bible says when he came down, his face radiated began to rub off on him. Preacher, that's what I need. I need God to do something so that I get a fresh look at Jesus Christ. That's one of the benefits of a mountaintop experience. Could I give you a second one here, also in Luke chapter 9 and verse number 30. Luke chapter 9 and verse 30. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Not only did Peter, James, and John, when they are up on that mountain, not only did they see the Lord in a way that they had never seen him before, and that was a good thing. 
We notice here that it says in verse 30 that as Peter, James, and John were with the Lord, two others showed up. We know that those two others, it says, were Moses and Elias. Of course, Moses was that great Old Testament character that God gave the law to. Moses was respected throughout the Old Testament. Moses was the man that led two million Jews through the wilderness for 40 years. Moses was the one that had led them through the Red Sea. Moses was the one that had secured the manna and secured the quail. They had a high regard for Moses. Wow, Moses showed up. Not only do we read in verse 30 that Moses showed up, but we also read that Elijah showed up, another Bible great. Elijah was the one that God used to challenge King Ahab and Queen Jezebel when those two had persecuted preachers and prophets. Elijah single-handedly had stood up against those and you know, without a doubt, uh, Moses and Elijah had accomplished some great things for God without a question. And so how easy it would have been now for Peter, James, and John, after having seen the Lord like they'd never seen him before, how easy it would have been for Peter, James, and uh, Moses. Wow, wow, we're so glad that you're here. We've read all about Elijah. We are so glad to get to meet you. Why? We think much of the two of you. But look what those two had to say it was far more important than talking about them. Verse 31. Who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. You know, as great as Moses was, he had his faults. You know, as great as Elijah was, he had his faults. And just maybe on this mountaintop experience as Peter and James and John were maybe just making it too much of Moses and Elijah, maybe. You ever thought about that? Isn't it true that sometimes we as Christians, we make a little too much of people, even good people, even faithful people, and we kind of elevate some people far higher than we should. And I think that maybe Moses and Elijah showing up here in the presence of Peter, James, and John, all of a sudden, all of a sudden after having seen the Lord as they'd never seen him before, the, boy, now their attention has shifted to Moses and shifted to Elijah. And Moses and Elijah, who could very easily have taken credit they said, no, no, and they said, we're here to talk about the Lord. Again, look at verse 31, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease. You know, those two men, whether they knew all that God had done with them, they said, listen, the only one we need to talk about now is the Lord. But I say to you, not only the benefit of a mountaintop experience is for inspiration, that we might see our Lord better, I suggest that the second benefit of mountaintop experience is for realization. Realization, and that's that we might see others less. Sometimes we elevate people far higher than we should. Sometimes we make too much of people, much more than we should. You say, preacher, why would you think that that's what was happening here? Well, look there in verse number 32. But Peter and they that were with them were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias, not knowing what he said. Do you know, Peter thought that this is such a good place to be, that why don't we just build three tabernacles? I know that some think that a tabernacle is just a tent. Well, there were six people on that mountain. Why would they just build three tents? Why not six tents? You know, I know that word tabernacle when it shows up the book in Esther. 
It's a booth. It's a tent. Well, that's not what Peter's doing here. Peter is elevating that tabernacle that he's suggesting maybe to worship. Pastor, why would you think that? Because no sooner had Peter made this suggestion of making three tabernacles, one for Jesus and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Look at the Lord. Look at God in heaven, verse 34. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. Could I suggest to you that sometimes in our Christian life, yours and mine, not only sometimes we lose sight of the greatness of our Lord, and that can be fixed with a mountaintop experience, but there are also some times where we elevate people too high. You know, the best of men are men at best. And if you haven't had some man or some woman that you've had great confidence in somehow disappoint you, then you've not been around the block very long. You know, the best of preachers will disappoint you. The best of missionaries will disappoint you. The best of evangelists will disappoint you. The best of uh, Sunday school teachers and piano players and song leaders and deacons and workers in a church say, Pastor, I used to look up to that guy and I'll tell you what, he greatly disappointed me. That's the reality of people's lives. And you know what, if you've had your focus on people. It's a matter of time till people will break your hearts. And here we see that Peter is kind of getting distracted from the Lord, that that was a good thing, that he saw the Lord as he'd never seen him before. But now he's beginning to focus on Moses and beginning to focus on Elijah. And I thank God for people that have been a great encouragement in my life just as much as you ought to be thankful for people that have been encouragement in your life. But people are just people. And the closest, the closer that you get to people, you'll begin to see things that you've never seen and, and some negative things and some disappointing things. And if your hope and your confidence and your trust is resting upon people, they will break your heart eventually. You know what happens with the mountaintop experience? First, not only do we get a sight of the Lord, like maybe we haven't seen in a long time, and we need that. But secondly, we'll be reminded that we need to take our minds and our eyes off of people. If I've disappointed you, and that's very possible, you need a mountaintop experience to get me in the right perspective and get God in his right perspective. Because just as sure as I could have disappointed you, you could have disappointed somebody else. I'm saying to you that there are already two benefits of a mountaintop experience. First one is for inspiration, that we might see our Lord better. Second one is for realization, and that's that uh, we might see others less. You know, I'm glad that God uses people, but as I've said, the best of people are people at best. Let's never make the mistake of putting people on the same plane as the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's be careful whether in our minds or from our lips we praise on people that belongs to God. You know, I was actually sitting in a service one time where there was a guest preacher. It wasn't here, but there was a guest preacher and, and the pastor of the church was announcing this guest preacher. And he said this, he said, this man is my hero. And I honestly don't think he ever sins. <laughs> and you know what? We who had confidence in the guest preacher, as soon as he made that statement, it kind of... It kind of put a wet blanket. Folks, all of us sin. All of us do. And if in your mind, that particular somebody, 
you have set him on a pedestal higher than God ever intended for him to be. The second benefit of a mountaintop experience is to fix that. It's to get your eyes to be taken off of people. That's why Isaiah, he said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips. And you know, the evidence that you've been on this kind of a spiritual mountain is who you have your attention on after it's done. It's your attention on God, and you say, well, it was just a great meeting. How would that be measured? How would a great meeting be measured? Well, listen, folks, I've been, to, I've been to some camp meetings before where all the, all the excitement was orchestrated. I, I, I didn't go to this one, but a preacher friend told me, he said he was down in a special meeting, and he said there was two men in the back lobby, and they had a wheelchair, no one's in the wheelchair, didn't need a wheelchair, those two men, and from the very front, a uh, preacher gives a wink to these two men in the back, one of them jumps in a wheelchair, and he, the other guy's pushing him around the auditorium with a flag just a waving, and say, preacher, oh, that's orchestrated. We're not interested in doing anything like that. I said to visiting preachers that we've had, I said, you know, we're Canadian. We don't hoop law and raw and raw and all the rest of that about every announcement that's given. You know, when we announce that the meal will start at 12.30, we don't have 10 people. Hey, man, glory to God. Now, if they do it on their own, that just means they're hungry. I understand we're not orchestrating that kind of stuff. But I'm saying to you the second benefit of a camp meeting is being reminded that people are just people. They have their failures, they have their faults, they have their bad days, and a wise Christian never measures a Christian by their bad day. Peter had a bad day. Peter denied the Lord. But you can't measure Peter by his lowest day. Because 50 days later, that same Peter on the day of Pentecost preached 3,000 people were converted. And you say, well, preacher, I'm, I'm just disappointed in him and her and him and preacher and you too. Well, maybe you've had these people too high in your estimation. Again, we're looking at the benefits of a mountaintop experience. First one is for inspiration, that we might see our Lord better. The second one is for realization that we might see others less. Could I give you a third one? Look there in Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22, you can let go of Luke, but Genesis 22 is a third mountaintop experience, and I would suggest it's a third thing that could be accomplished in these days that we have planned ahead. Pastor, what's the third thing that could happen in a mountaintop experience? Genesis chapter 22 and verse number 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, here is a third mountaintop experience. Here we have this man, Abraham, who we know is a very familiar Old Testament name. Back in Genesis chapter 12, God called this man, Abraham, to leave his country, leave his kindred. God said, I'm going to show you a land. Show? You're just going to show? And Abraham, as much as all the details weren't filled in, we read that Abraham did leave Ur with his wife, with his nephew, with his belongings, and they began to make that trip, Genesis 12. This is the same Abraham some years later. And I'm sure that Abraham, he's called a man of faith. God promised Abraham that he would be the father of a great nation. And Abram believed what God said in Genesis 15. God promised Abraham that his lineage would be as the sand of the seashore. God made some great promises to this Abraham, and Abram believed it. But you know, 
the one difficulty Abraham had, he and his wife Sarah had no children. She was barren at 86, and he was 99, and they had no children. And they struggled with that thought. And do you know, Abraham's faith got a little thin right about then, and when Sarah came to Abraham and said, I can't give you children, why don't you have a child by Hagar or handmaid? Oh, if just Abram was a man of faith at that point, but he fell to that trap and that trick. And we know because of all that that uh, Ishmael was born. But finally, when Abram was 100, God blessed him with a son named Isaac. And how Abram loved that boy. I'm sure everywhere that Abram went, Isaac went. And that boy Isaac was just his dream come true. And I think God looked down upon that. I think you ought to love your children. I think I ought to love my children. Say, preacher, they're not doing everything that makes me happy. Do you know God loves you when you don't do everything that makes God happy? And so Abram loved Isaac. And that was the reason for the third mountaintop experience. Look at Genesis 22. Again at verse number 1, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. I know that some have a difficult time with that word tempt. If you look over there in the book of James, it, it explains as a test. Keep reading Genesis 22, 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abram and said unto, Abram, uh, said unto him, Abram, and he said, Behold, here am I. Sorry, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get into the land of Moriah. Stop right there for just a minute. God is speaking to Abraham. And God says, Abraham, and he says, Lord, here I am. He said, I want you to take a trip. And he said, I want you to take your son on this trip with you. At that moment, maybe Abraham got a little excited. Here he's getting to go to a, on another trip. I mean, since Genesis 12, he's not heard of trips. Now he's taking another trip. And he gets to take his son. Well, there's some tricky words found there in verse number 2. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Well, every parent should love their children. But there's something to be found here in verse 2. And get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Lord, am I hearing you right? You want me to take this son that's been such an answer to prayer? You want me to take this boy that I love so very much? You want me to kill him? God, you can't mean that. That, I, I got to be hearing this thing wrong. Look there in verse number three. And Abram rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. Do you know as much as I don't think Abram understood what God was doing? Aren't you glad the very next verse says he did it anyway? He took that boy and took the servants and took these things. And he began to take this journey that God told him to take, middle of verse 3, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him then on the third day. So this journey took three days. And I don't know, I'm pretty confident Abram didn't tell his wife Sarah what they were up to. Just going for a trip, honey. How long are you going to be? Well, we're at least going to be gone three days, probably a week, though. I don't think he told her what God had said. As they take this trip, I just think every night, as they stop around that campfire, I think as Isaac nods off to sleep, that boy, I think Abram looks at that son and knows what God has asked him to do. And he looks up to heaven and said, God, would you at least repeat so I don't, I don't have this thing, no answer. God, you must have made a mistake. No answer. 
God, I've got a couple of servants. How about I kill these servants instead of my son? No answer. And you know, Abram, as much as he didn't understand what God was doing, he still continued on this trip. It said there in Genesis 22, look there again in verse number 4, then on the third day, Abram lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abram said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And you know, he doesn't understand what God is doing. But he's fully prepared to do that. I wonder, is that you? You see, preacher, I do not understand what God's doing in my life. I don't understand what God's doing in my home. I don't understand what God's doing in my family. That's why the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not under thy own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Mo, or Abraham, rather, he could have said, Lord, until you give me the end picture, I am not going to head out to those mountains. But he didn't. If you're a Christian this morning and, and, and you're in the midst of a, a life and you do not understand what God's doing, you can't afford to stand still. You have to continue to do everything else that God has asked you to do, trusting that God will work those deeds. Say, preacher, why did God even... Have Abram take his son up there on the mountain. I think the secret is right there in the middle of verse 2. And he said, take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. I, I think it was a test to see if Abraham loved God more than he loved that boy. If you're honest, isn't it true that there are sometimes things that we love more than we love God? And there's some things that are more important to us than God's smile in our life. And so it was a test. You know, God watched as Abraham took that three-day journey. God watched as Abraham and his son Isaac went up on that mountain. God watched as Abraham built that altar. God watched as Abraham put his son upon that altar. God watched as Abraham took that knife and leaned back and was ready to plunge it in his own son, not knowing what God was doing that whole time. If you don't know what God's doing, trust him. Still keep doing the right thing. But look there as we continue reading this. Genesis chapter number 12 and verse number 9. I'm sorry, Genesis 22 verse 9. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abram built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abram stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abram, Abram, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything for him for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. It was a test to see if Abraham loved God more than anything else in his life. And I wonder, do you love God more than anything else in your life? You say, preacher, my future is so important to me. Would you lay your future down for the pleasure of God? Pastor, my income, my my. My, my opportunities, would you lay a preacher, I am respected in society. Pastor, I'm, I'm admired by my friends. Would you lay all that down for the pleasure of the Lord Jesus Christ? It was a test, and he passed the test. You're taking notes, the third thing. Third benefit of a mountaintop experience is for organization for organization that we might better arrange our loves below. You know, sometimes God does things in our life we don't understand. Sometimes a Christian finds himself laying flat in their back in a hospital bed and doesn't know why. Sometimes God puts them in a bunker 
mortar shells exploding around, and they don't understand why. Sometimes we have to wait upon God while we wait in an emergency ward. Sometimes we lose a job that we had. We thought we had the rest of our life. I'm saying sometimes God allows details in our life that we had no idea. You say, preacher, why would God do this? Just, just maybe to get that organization and get the right things as being the most important. wonder, would you pray, Lord, in these days of our camp meeting ahead, I've got my priorities out of order. Would you please fix them? Would you please show me them? It wasn't until Abraham went up on this mountain that God fixed that priority. I give you the last thing. I'm done with this. Look there in Luke chapter number 6. Luke chapter number 6. Pastor, what are the benefits of a mountaintop experience? What could God do at this camp meeting that we are planning? Luke chapter 6. Well, First of all, you might get to see the Lord like you've never seen him before, and that will help your Christian life. Again, Luke chapter 6, the second benefit is God might just help you to get your eyes off of people, people that maybe have disappointed you, people maybe that you have held too high on a podium. Third thing that could happen in this mountaintop experience is maybe the priorities of your life are not the priorities God would have. I gave you the last one, Luke chapter 6. Look there in verse number 12. Luke chapter 6 and verse 12, and it came to pass in those days that he, that's Jesus, went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Verse 13, and when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve whom he named apostles. Our Lord, by this time, had been busy in the ministry. He had already been doing miracles. He had a a group of disciples. Now, not apostles, disciples. He had many disciples. And those disciples had followed our Lord wherever he went. The Bible says in verse 13 that on a particular day, he called unto him all of his disciples. 50, 80, 100, 120, 120. We're not told how many. But it says in the last part of verse 13, and of them he chose 12. And so our Lord, this was a milestone in his public ministry. Up to this point, he had done all the ministry. Disciples had followed, they'd watched. And now he's going to appoint 12 of them to be apostles. We're familiar with the list. Look at verse number 14. Simon, whom we also named Peter. Simon Peter, we know him. Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphie. We know those names. Could I suggest to you, as he was on that mountain praying that night before, he was praying, Lord, God, Father, who do you want me to pick to be the twelve? What names do you want to be part of the twelve? We understand that next day pick Peter and Andrew. We know the list, James and John. But you know what's the most amazing thing about that list? Look there in Luke chapter 6 and verse 16. And Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. Hold on a minute. I, I, I know that Jesus is God. I know that. But if you and I were picking which 12 out of 100 that we would appoint to be an apostle, would you have picked Judas Iscariot? I wouldn't have. If I knew that that man was going to betray me, that that man was going to sell me for 30 pieces of... I would never have picked that man. And yet that was accomplished because Jesus went up on top of the mountain. Can I give you the last thing? Last thing that can be accomplished in a mountaintop experience. The fourth benefit is for illumination. For illumination. You see, what does that mean? That we might set our sights ahead. 
Folks, I wonder, maybe, maybe you've got a big decision before you. Maybe it's a major. Maybe it's who you're going to marry. Maybe it's where you're going to live. Maybe it's you're going to move. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. You say, preacher, it's all set. I know what I'm doing. Is it what God wants you to do? Have you asked God for the specific details for him to make it clear? Well, I already know what I'm going to do. Is it what God wants you to do? And all too many times, folks, we as Christians, we have our path all laid out. We know where we're going to go, and we know where we want to end up. Have you talked to God about that? Have you asked God if that's the steps that he wants you to take? Because quite honestly, I don't understand why Jesus would have picked Judas Iscariot. Short of his father telling him that night before, you need to pick that too. You say, preacher, I, I, I know where I want to be in five years and 10 years and 20 years. But you know where God wants you to be in five years and 10 years and 20 years? And do you care? Does it matter? That's the fourth benefit of a mountaintop experience. That God would show you what the next step and the next step is. I think that many of you would be familiar with the name Oswald Chambers. Oswald Chambers has a number of books that are very encouraging, very helpful. You know, I remember reading the testimonial of his wife. Oswald Chambers was a Scottish-born preacher. And many times when Oswald Chambers would go to a church service, and he'd preach, there would inevitably be one or two or five or ten people after the service that would come to him and say, could I have just a minute or two of your time? And he was trying to be a help to people, and so he said, sure, that would be fine. And sometimes they just had complaints about somebody else in the ministry, and sometimes they genuinely had a trouble they didn't know what to deal with. And Oswald Chambers' wife recounted in this particular testimony, and she recounted about a woman that came up to her husband and said, oh, Mr. Chambers, I, I feel I must tell you all about myself. And, and as Oswald Chambers led her off to a private place where she could talk and he could listen, Mrs. Chambers said, this will be a long one. I've heard this one before. And to her absolute surprise, within less than two minutes, Oswald Chambers comes back. And that woman, woman goes different direction. And on their way home from that service, Mrs. Chambers says to her husband, that was quick. <laughs> what did you say to end that conversation, that counseling, so very quick. And he looked at her and he said, that woman said, I would like to tell you all about myself. And he said, when we got off to the side, he said, ma'am, have you taken the time to tell the Lord all about yourself? And with surprise across her face, she said, why no? And he said, I think it's time you talk to the Lord. And he said, after you talk to the Lord, if he wants you to talk to me, I'll be as ready to listen as you'd like. But I think that you first need to talk to the Lord. And you know the fourth benefit of a mountaintop experience is to get us to ask God, God, is this what you want? Is this the path that you'd have my, me take? God, I'm kind of disappointed with people. But God, maybe it's because I've had too much confidence in people. Maybe I've lost sight of you. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you know that as Christians, we ought to start every day talking to God. We ought to start every day asking God, God, what would you like of me today? 
What steps would you have me take today? Lord, would you help me to see you better today? Would you speak to me from your word today? You know, in the beginning of your day, you might need to say, Lord, if I'm losing ground as a Christian because I've got my eyes on people, help me to get my eyes off of people. Help me to get my eyes on you. All of these things could be reaped as you spend time alone with God. But you know, sometimes it takes a mountaintop experience. And I'm asking you as the pastor of this church, as we prepare so hard for this camp meeting, I'm asking you to ask God, God, in these days ahead, would you help me to see you better? God, would you help me to see people less? God, would you help me to make sure I love you more than anyone or anything else? God, would you help me to ask you, What's your choice? Father, would you help us this morning? We're trying to get our hearts ready for camp meeting. It's more than recipes. It's more than schedules of who's to do the task next. It's more than tying up garbage bags. and It's more than parking people in an orderly fashion. God, all those are necessary details for a meeting. God, for you to speak to our hearts, only you can do that. Lord, if you don't speak to our hearts in these days ahead, maybe it's because we're not looking for that. Would you help us to look for that? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, with no one looking around this morning, I wonder, is there one pastor as you preached about what God could do in a mountaintop experience? Preacher, I want God to do something special in my heart. I need God to do something special in my heart. And I'm willing between now and then to ask him. And preacher, know you care. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for all of us that God would do some, something special in these days ahead? Preacher, here's my uplifted hand. God bless you. God bless you. A number of hands. Father, would you help us? Would you help us not to wait till that first Wednesday night service Would you help us not to wait for that first preacher that night to begin a work in our hearts? Instead, Lord, would you begin to prepare our hearts now? Think of that old song, impressing on the upward way, seeking that higher ground. Lord, if it's a mountaintop experience that accomplishes these things, prepare us even now. Bless the invitation. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed as the piano begins to play? Would you already now, days ahead, weeks ahead, ask God to do something supernatural in your heart? Would you ask God to help you to see God better? Would you ask God to help you to look at people less? Would you ask God to help you love him more than anyone else would you ask God what his steps are what he wants you to do why don't you talk to God this morning As the piano continues to play. Do you know that first and second reason that we could see the Lord better and look at others less? Those are welcoming things. But you know when Abraham went up on that mountain, God was asking him to sacrifice something that was dear to him. 
It could be, it could be that God is looking for you to sacrifice something that's dear to you. Are you ready for it? Are you willing to do that? And maybe in these days ahead, Lord, help me to be willing to do whatever you'd like me to do. Let's close a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for these mountaintop experiences. We read of them throughout the scriptures. And Father, we see how you changed men and women, young people. How you changed their outlook and changed their desires and changed them when they are on this kind of a mountaintop. Lord, I pray, we, we beg of you with all of our preparations that, Lord, you would do in our hearts what we cannot do. Help us. Pray to take us home now this afternoon. Give us rest. Bring us back for prayer at 5.30, service at 6. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed.